Well, I'm, I'm really excited to introduce our three distinguished panelists, and they will each have five minutes to share their presentation with us before we open it up for, for question and answer afterwards. Our first panelist is Marina Pavlic, the president of Serbia on the Move. Uh, Marina is a philosopher who was introduced to community organizing in 2009, and ever since she's been active in applying the LCN framework in Serbia on the Move. Our second panelist will be Nisreen Haj Ahmad. Nisreen is a Palestinian lawyer who did her MPA at Harvard in 2007. That's when she studied and worked with Marshall Gans, and in 2010 she moved to Jordan where she co-founded AHEL and is now its director. And finally, our third speaker is going to be Peja Stojic. He is a physician from Serbia who has focused his work on the application of community organizing to public health issues in the US. He's a graduate of the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and currently working for Rethink Health, an initiative of Fannie E. Ripple Foundation from New Jersey. So please uh, be sure to keep track of any questions that you have as the presenters are speaking and type them into the chat. Actually, before we go into our first speaker, I just want to ask, can anybody step up to be a chat monitor during this session? So as speakers are, are presenting, uh, just keep track of the questions and comments that are coming up in the chat box so that we can get to it um, once we are ready for question and answer. Can anybody help out with that? Just raise your hand or chat in the chat box if you can help monitor the chat. So basically just track what questions people raise. Okay, Yomna. Thank you so much, Yomna, uh, for stepping up to do that. Okay, great. So now I will pass it over to Marina to kick it off with our first presentation. Marina? Thank you very much. Uh, just give me a second to put my presentation. So, okay. Um, Hi everyone, I will talk a bit about Serbian Move and how we use the LCN pedagogy for the last nine years uh, in order to build our organization and to make changes in Serbia. So the story of Serbia on the Move uh, has started with beautiful friendship of Anna, who is leading this meeting today, and Predrag, who you will meet very soon, uh, two people who share the same passion to work on making better conditions for the people who live in our my country and our country. So uh, Petya spent three months in the United States uh, volunteering for the Obama presidential campaign. And uh, there he learned a lot about organizing and this methodology. Uh, on the other hand, Anna talked with her friends and colleagues. And as a result, two of them organized a group of seven people who, are, who were willing to work on driving changes in Serbia. And you can see those people on the screen. Uh, that was back in 2009, uh, the same year I went on the workshop they made. Uh, and it was about public performance. And I remember I was very shocked when Peja called me after that and asked me, would you be interested to be a team leader in the healthcare corruption campaign? And I said yes, uh, not because I was so uh, passionate about healthcare, uh, but uh, because I have finally found the people who are willing to fight for something, not just against something. And uh, back then, uh, we didn't have the office, we didn't have the project, but we had uh, 20 people who were willing to work this job, uh, to uh, try organizing and to practice it. And so, uh, Serbia on the Move created their, of our first campaign, uh, I'm not on the take, I work for the salary, uh, aiming to identify and recruit doctors who announced that they will not take the bribe. So uh, ever since that moment, uh, we used campaigns as a motor of our organizations, um, and um, we use them not just to involve new people in the structure, but also to give the opportunity to old ones to grow and develop. Uh, for example, in the first campaign, I'm not on the take, I work for the salary, I was a team leader, but uh, in the second phase of the same campaign, I was a coordinator for another mm -hmm. town. Uh, in the next campaign, what is the doctor like? I was a trainer and uh, I was recruiting new people in the campaign. And after that, I was leading my own campaign with a bunch of people in the leadership team, a campaign called I Can. And after that, I became a member of a leadership team of the whole organization. And at this moment, I'm president. So as you can see, 
um, we didn't use the campaigns only for changes that we wanted to make, uh, but uh, we use it also to build the uh, uh, capacity of the people of in in our structure so i would like to show you one example of um campaign that we did uh this is the campaign right for moms in which we organized 250 moms in order to talk with 250 mps in the national assembly uh and they wanted to explain why it's important for them to uh, get the uh, payments on time uh, during the maternity leave. And they did that. Uh, so uh, from July this year, we actually changed the law. Um, uh, but after each campaign, like this one, um, after a few years, we realized that uh, people are leaving, that after each campaign, that was the end of the process for many activists in the during the process and uh, we wanted to change that and in order to change that in 2015 we developed the concept of clubs of serbia on the move um, those are those were like chapters uh, in different parts of the serbia so um, we started to look on national campaigns as an entry point for people who would like to learn how to organize and practice it after in their own campaigns, they are really passionate about. Uh, example of that is one of the first clubs of Serbian the Move uh, from Bor, uh, one small town in the eastern part of the Serbia, um, who organized uh, the young people in order to get the youth center in their town. After one year campaign, uh, they 100 young people got the whole building and they're using that uh, building now for many activists. Uh, they have seven active teams um, at this moment in the structure. So uh, it is interesting that both of those campaigns, uh, Right for Moms and Youth in the Center, were a zero budget campaign. And we do apply um, on the projects, uh, but we also work on the project that we don't have money for just because we want to work on that. Um, how, uh, how I would like to just say a few words about our structure. So uh, we have a national assembly uh, that is happening once per year, and there we choose a president, um, and president is choosing the board. Uh, and we also have su supervisor committee uh, this, that is looking that board is doing all the job that it should be. Um, and uh, we have 54 members uh, with right to vote, and we have more than 200 people who don't have right to vote, but they are there. And uh, we have more than 20 active teams at this moment all over the country. So uh, in order to get here, um, we trained more than 2,000 people uh, because we really do believe that people are power. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marina. Let's give Marina quick round of applause. And then uh, I'm gonna invite Nisreen now to please share your screen and share your presentation. Yes, hi everyone. Here is my presentation. And folks, remember if you have any questions that come up, please type them in the chat or keep track of them so we can get to them after. All right, so um, thank you for this opportunity, Anna and um, everyone. Oops. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, I did an organization as uh, as, Je um, as Jeff said called Ahel, and Ahel is mentioned in the Quran, and it means uh, those who can and those who deserve. So we named our organization Ahel so that we can work with people of the cause or pe the constituency um, with, a, with the cause or with a problem that they need to solve. And because we think they can and they deserve um, the change they, they need. Um, Ahel is a non-for-profit organization. We, um, our success is when uh, we introduce, train, coach on community organizing to build people power uh, so that the people can achieve the change they want towards justice and freedom specifically. So we've um, established ourselves in 2010. So far we have coached 18 campaigns. Uh, 14 of them have won. 
there are different kinds of campaigns in different fields, political, social, workers' rights, um, in health, in education. These campaigns together have moved more than 200,000 people in action in six Arab countries. Um, to, um, to train the campaign and coach them, we've run 210 workshops, uh, trained 3,500 leaders, and to be able to do that, as you see in the picture, we're a very small team of five full-timers, one part-timer, but we have a network of 30 community organizing coaches. I'll tell you how we uh, identify them and train them in a bit. Um, this triangle shows how our work at AHEL or our framework at AHEL has evolved. Um, our objective, as I said, is to build people power. And um, we use organizing so that people organize collective action in demanding their rights. But we've also discovered during the years that uh, community organizing has to have um, a dimension of building knowledge. So if we're working with teachers, as we are doing now in demanding their rights, they also have to learn the uh, laws, the uh, how to do collective negotiations, how to um, understand their contract. And that's the, in the triangle, that's the one on the right, knowledge, information, and skills through educationals. And the third dimension we've, which we've introduced only last year is building consciousness. And that, um, we do through popular education uh, circles, emancipatory learning. Not sure about the terminology yet, it's been evolving to be honest, but the idea is that they uh, reflect on, they uh, become more aware of, of um, concepts uh, like authority, like um, responsibility, accountability. There is no teaching in these sessions and it's very much story-based. I can talk about it a little bit more, but it helps in growing the base, as Marshall and Harry were saying, especially in a community that has high fear and is not used to organizing. So it's a step towards going towards demanding their rights. This uh, image shows you an example of a journey uh, we have with uh, some of the campaigns we've coached. We're not a training institute. We're a leadership building institute and we we prefer coaching to giving a workshop here and there so we will walk the journey with the campaign um okay someone is sending me messages but i can't see it um if it's time check just speak aloud please okay so uh, we start with the uh, initiators they somebody who wants to start a, cam a campaign or a uh, collective action in their community. We work with them um, to launch a, for them to launch a listening drive to recruit for their core team. And when they have a core team ready, we run what we call an SSS workshop. That's a story strategy and structure workshop to build the core team and have an idea about the campaign's objective and theory of change and what they want to build in terms of leadership teams. Then we coach that core team in. Um, on, on recruitment. So they as well go and recruit others to build more teams so that they scale in an organized fashion. Now, as they scale even further beyond that initial team, they need to test those leaders they find. So there's often um, training on house meetings, for example. And they've now launched their campaign and drawing some of the tactics. And there's often early failures that we're coaching them to learn from and introduce learning as a spirit in their organizing. While this is happening, they've recruited more people and now is the time for a community organizing workshop. That's when we go into a room and perhaps they've, or they've recruited 60 people, um, 10 teams, 10 neighborhood teams. And that's when the campaign goes into further local strategies or local tactics. From there on, our objective is for those teams to be stable, to be healthy, to have um, good coordinators, to have good norms. So we focus our coaching on the team coordinators, let's say the 10 teams that were established in the community organizing workshop. And now they are running their campaigns um, plan and their tactics and one peak after the other. Our role becomes less um, intensive but yet important because we run their reflection and learning sessions after the peaks and often there are challenges or tensions that an outsider facilitator who knows organizing and who's been 
accompanying print campaigns can help them uh, discuss or learn from. Um, during thank, this- Thank you, Nusri. We're, we're, we're just about okay. at time. If you can just take, take a second to wrap up, please. All right, I'll do that. Um, during that phase, there's a need to sometimes re-strategize, scale even further, or retell the story. Until the campaign is done, there's the supporting them in closing it, whether with celebration, learning, and deciding what is the next objective if, of course, they've built a base. Um, I'll leave this for questions if people are interested. How we build our coaches and how we prepare them. Thank you. Jeff and everyone, I'll stop sharing and hand it over to Petra. Thank you, Nasreen. Thanks, Yeah, I will share my screen in just a second. All right, let's give it up for Nasreen while Petra's getting his act together. Thank you. Um, okay, so my name is Peja Stojic and uh, I, I just want to thank uh, Marina for, for mentioning me and kind of like the story of the Serbian Maduro because it's such a, you know, it's, it's, it's been close to my heart, but that's not what I'm going to speak about today. I'm actually going to speak about my work in the United States that is related to healthcare. And interestingly enough, I, I just put this slide to kind of like intimidate people, but, <laughs> but it's actually really to talk about kind of like I've, I've been working with health systems kind of like in Serbia and many in, in Europe and, and in the United States, but I think the United States health system is probably the most complex and the most unjust system in the world uh, for many reasons and, and, and most probably is for the reasons of kind of like complexity and who is paying and who is actually receiving and, and all of that, which I think there's a, there's a background story behind it, but we don't want to get into it. But, you know, our work, everything health work with the with, um, uh, U.S. healthcare system has been now like we've been working for, for five years and we've been specifically working with Center for Medicare and Medicaid, uh, you know, which mo most of you know from kind of like Medicare and Medicaid, two big, big uh, uh, different programs. And thanks to the Obama administration and actually presence of Don Berwick, who I, I think Marshall mentioned, mentioned in his speak from Institute for Health Improvements, uh, he was there just for a year, but he instituted this idea that community organizing can actually give um, a, a different way of, of, of people working in healthcare doing the work. So part of the Medi uh, Center for Medicaid and Medicaid is the quality improvement organizations. To give you a sense of what they are, this, this has been a program that is there for about like 30, 40 years. And most of it is like, you know, uh, nurses or physicians who are dedicated their work to quality improvement, improving the quality of healthcare that is provided to patients, to the communities. And for years, it's been in a program that was just providing technical assistance. Like they're specifically, you know, if a, if a hospital or a nursing home, if somebody's asking them for support, uh, they will come in and they will teach them how to do, how to provide care. And that was their only role, and that was the only role that they can imagine. So in, in uh, five years ago, uh, Reading Health, we were asked to support this whole network across the country in 52 states. Um, you know, many, many practitioners and many, many workers in, in that whole network of community uh, uh, quality improvement organizations, which again, on, like if you can imagine the bureaucracy, they're on top of the, the, the pile because they've been operating as, a, as an auditor to healthcare organization for years as well. Uh, so they've asked us to help them you know, institute the community organizing practice in this, um, in this group um, and, you know, to do it across the state, across the different states and without a budget for the travel, which makes their life kind of like a really interesting one and, and kind of like a challenge uh, as well, an interesting one. Um, so a team of us like Kate Hilton, who some of you might know, myself and Ella Auchincloss, who were kind of gathering to, we, we got together and, and started thinking about like, how do we address this issue and how do we actually create a, a new way of thinking for this wonderful physicians and nurses who just for years has been doing this technical assistance work. Um, and we, you know, we started with key leadership practices that we all know whoever was part of the, the, any type of organizing workshop that using Marshall's pedagogy will know that public narrative, building relationships, uh, structure, strategy, and action will be the components. Um, and we said, we're going to do, we're going to build a leadership ladder for them over the course of five years to see what, what we can do. 
and we started with an online training program that we you know creatively call an LOA which is learning uh, leadership and organizing in action not the same one as, as the one that, that is taught at Harvard uh, but you know a 14 week long term course uh, with you know the usual online sessions and stuff that we do and through the course of three iterations we actually certified around like 300 participants and for most of them this was a really change in the way they were thinking about their practice the way they were working on stuff and, and those types of things but that was not not enough to actually create a sustainability of the program so we started a, a coaching program so basically those who were actually using the practices from the LOA uh, in their work we, we develop a structure to support them and kind of like to coach them through that journey and then finally, like at some point we realized, well, this is not enough. They are using it, they're practicing it, but how can we make it, you know, once we are gone, once we, we are not there to support them anymore, how they can continue this work. So we eventually launched the Train for Train program, which was on the ground and supporting, you know, over 60 trainers across the 32 the, the, the states and quality improvement programs. And, and that was a way to actually create a structure that will last even beyond uh, when when this program is over, so what was interesting Thank you, for us, we're yeah, just out uh, of time again. If you can just, just kind of wrap just, up, just I'm going to wrap up. So when we ask them a question at the end, how do you consider yourself? What are you right now? Like those groups that we've been working with, like it's interesting that they've recognized themselves as mobilizers for collective actions, like facilitators and coaches for the community. Uh, you know, backbone support to the organizations, voice of beneficiaries and families. And if you ask them that five years ago, the answer would be vastly different and they will be talk, talking about like we are supporting the healthcare provision here and we're just there to provide technical assistance. Some of them are even now seeing themselves as community organizers and fighters for social justice, which I think it's a big shift for a, a, a huge bureaucratic organization and most importantly, the way they think about their work and how they can engage with the community. So. Awesome. Thank you so much, Pedja. Let's give a quick round of applause to all of our presenters for your work here and for all the work that you're doing in your respective communities. Um, please take some time to chat questions into the chat box, everybody. Um, and again, Yomna, thank you for helping us to keep track of the questions and comments that happen in the chat. Uh, I'll just kick us off uh, and, then, and, then, and then we'll go into the chat. And, and this is kind of building off of um, some questions that uh, Jake posed. Uh, but we'll, f to all three of you, what have been some of your key takeaways in terms of the role of coaching? What, what, uh, coaching and training, what have you found works best to build the capacity of your constituency, of your leadership team in regards to training, um, and coaching and we'll have until we have another five minutes unfortunately before we need to go back to the big room Does anybody want to jump in with that? One thing that worked with coaching is um, Storytelling sharing stories you've heard from one campaign to the other campaign stories around um, stories that coach the heart pretty much about around fear around hesitation um, that's one of the takeaways we've had with uh, coaching campaigns um, the other is keeping a relationship so not disappearing on your on the leaders you work with on the team core no having a transparent or an explicit explicit relationship about the coaching and its stability Excellent. Yeah, one, one, one comment about that, I think from, from, from our perspective, there was a, a really interesting shift once they start, once people started teaching other people how to do that. So basically the train the trainer concept, one, like a lot of them were saying like that was the actual moment when we understood, really understood what was, what was, <laughs> what was this all about because they were asked to, to, to train others in the, in the skills and, and the communities that they work with. And, and, you know, like, Coaching actually, in that sense, was a critical, critical shift for all of them. Like, how do they think about their role in community from just giving people advice to actually really coach them to enable them to do the work? And, and you know, for, for some of them, that was, a, that was a big turning point. The coaching <laughs> clinic you had, Pedja, um, how, how did you measure its uh, success? 
well, well, yeah, there's a, we, we created a kind of like the whole evaluation program. I'm happy to share kind of like how do we evaluate that and, and, you know, all of that, but it was mostly around the experience, like, you know, like the, 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 to, to what extent they've, uh, the work and coaching we did with them impacted their, their work. And because it's a, such a bureaucratic structure, they have clear measures of impact. Like they are, their CMS is asking them to report on deliverables like to the crazy level. So we could actually, we were able to track if they were willing to share because there's a lot of regulation as well. Sometimes they were not willing to share, but if they were willing to share, like we could actually see the clear impact between those who were coached and those who were not coached and, and how, how that played out. And, and it was quite an interesting uh, way to observe the difference uh, that was substantial in some in some cases like you know we had people from Texas covering the whole state uh, uh, actually being able to do that just because they were enabling the snowflake structure across the country like all of a sudden wow. you know thank you guys uh, Yomna is there anything else that you noticed in the chat or, or does anybody else have questions uh, yes Jeff. go ahead have some questions in the chat. I had a question to Marina. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so he's asking you, Marina, about uh, what most helped you preparing uh, for these new roles? Uh, what hard uh, as you stepped up and what support was most helpful? Uh -huh. what, what did me, oh, okay. But, uh, first step uh, was always making a team. And when you have team, everything after that, it's much easier. So that was the part of preparing. And we always had a training for the roles that we're going to have. So uh, beside that, we always had uh, someone who is supervisor or coaching, a coacher uh, who is leading us during the process. So when you have all of that, then it's not easy. Then it's easy to move a step further every time. Awesome. Thank you. And good timing. I think we're going to find ourselves in the, in the big breakout room in, in just a second. But before that, does anybody have any other questions or comments that you want to share? And if anybody wants to share from your own experience too, go ahead. What was that, Nisreen? Just to follow up to Marina. So when you said you have training on the roles, like you get a special training on how to be a team coordinator, for example. So ah, no, that, 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 not, that not. Uh, we didn't have trainings like that, but we had like special sessions where we were thinking how, brainstorming how we would do that. And that was the preparing phase for the, for us to do the job. Did you have that leadership ladder um, set for, like, was it known that these are the steps of leadership you would do? Mm -hmm. No. On the move, or every person different. So at this moment, we are working on that. Uh, we want to put it like so everybody everybody can see it. Uh, so far, we did it, but it was uh, people actually didn't know how can they move. It was mostly like someone is picking you and telling you you can do that. This is your next step, and if you can say yes, that's it. But now we want to make a structure for that. Jeff, I see we're gonna yeah. head back. I'll just.